Hi there, my name is Josh, and today I want to explain TDP. TDP stands for Thermal Design Power. It is a measure to use how, on figuring out how much heat your processor produces and developing a system to get rid of that efficiently. It is usually represented using watts. So a server processor, for example, might use 200 watts and, have, and throw that much heat out, whereas a mobile processor might use like 10, my laptop it uses 15 and that's just to give you a ballpark estimate of the numbers we're dealing with so why does a processor produce heat in the first place it's because it's made up of transistors and transistors are an electrical component electricity goes through it and a small amount of resistance occurs this happens in all electrical components and with that resistance that heat heat is produced from it modern day processors have billions of transistors and each transistor produces a little bit of heat and it all culminates to a total package of perhaps 65 watts of heat. And we need to get rid of that because the processor is about the size of your fingernail and it can't naturally get rid of that on its own. It can't just exist. Otherwise the heat will build up, it will slow the processor down, it will stop it. And in some cases of older 2000s processors, it will break the processor and make it unusable because it will literally melt other components such as the plastic that it's packaged in. In order to cool itself, a processor needs what is called a heat sink. A heat sink is, in physical science terms, a place for heat to go. But in reality, it usually comes out to be a block of metal that you put on top of the CPU that draws heat away from it, and which then dissipates that heat into the air, possibly with the aid of a fan. So with the normal ones being aluminum, there might also be some higher end ones that are made with what's called heat pipes. A heat pipe is something that is, uh, think of a hollowed out core of metal. And in that core, there's, there's a liquid, it's kind of halfway filled. And that liquid helps to boil, to rise, and to move quicker than that heat would in metal. So think of it as just kind of water cooling, but not, you know, in a traditional pipe and pump and all that. Um, it's very self-contained and you never have to maintain them. So heat is usually transferred in a process given a normal computer build and that heat starts with the microchip which is a very tiny area and then it passes on to a thermal interface material. This could be thermal paste. Um, the idea of this is to bind two materials together in an efficient manner that is able to transfer heat well. And then, so we have our chip, we have some paste, and then we have what's called an integrated heat spreader. You'll often see this abbreviated as IHS. And the purpose of this IHS is to protect the CPU die from getting scratched, bent, or anything happening to it, as it's a very fragile piece of circuitry. So after the IHS, we have more thermal paste, uh, significantly more, as it's attached to a much bigger piece of metal and this is generally the heat sink that you will see in your systems and that heat sink is it might be it might start with some copper heat pipes that would draw heat away it might start with a solid copper what's called a copper bullet which can be thought of just as a cylinder of copper or it could just be all aluminum it's the idea of like there's a core thing to draw a lot of heat away and then spreading away from that, be it a heat pipe or core, is fins. And these fins are usually aluminum because they're cheap to make and, you know, well, it gets the job done. And from these aluminum fins, air is pushed onto them with the aid of a fan. And that, that fan pushing down on it allows the processor to be cooled in a very efficient manner. So it should be said that back in the 1990s, processors didn't need a fan. In fact, they didn't even need a big heat sink block at all. They were able to get away with just passively cooling themselves, given the kind of ambient airflow within the case. This is because processors were clocked much slower. In the case of around 1 megahertz, 500 kilohertz, very slow, and not enough to produce a whole lot of heat. The circuitry was also a lot more simpler, meaning there was less parts crammed into such a small amount of space. 
this also produced just less heat because there was less going on. Now, as processes are starting to get more complicated, and this was around possibly like 1998 was when it really kicked up, they had to have a, a heat sink attached and that heat sink would spread out the air. It would usually be cooled down by the power supply fan and there wasn't much attention given to this part of the computer. But moving on nowadays, we have processors that generally use about 65 watts in one package, and that's a lot of heat to get rid of, and you have to get rid of it quickly. Now, if you're using a commodity off-the-shelf PC, such as a laptop or desktop you got at Walmart or something, they will have a stock cooler included, and this is kind of the standard stock cooler for that line of processor that you're using. My laptop has this copper heat pipe that goes out and it spreads out stuff and it's great. It gets the job done. So for some higher end processors such as the Ryzen 9, the Ryzen Threadripper and Ryzen Epic and then you have the Intel Core i9, you have the Intel Xeon, these processors won't have stock heat sinks included and that's because the use cases for these processors vary a lot. If you're rocking like a Ryzen 9, you might be trying to get the most performance out of that chip as possible because you're running in a single system and you need to get stuff done. Perhaps you're editing a 4K video and you just need the extra oomph to make the day go a little bit faster. Other people, they might buy a AMD Epic chip, which is something like a 24 core, 64 core. It's, it's a lot of cores and that chip might not need to run as fast because you might be trying to get a stable server that's able to just process a lot of parallel requests and in a, a relatively efficient manner. So with that chip not being clocked as fast, it's going to produce a different heat sink requirement than the one you bought for your Ryzen 9 to get 5 gigahertz out of. There's also different form factors of cases. So some people might have a rack mount server and there's not a lot of space to put a, a big cooler in. Other people have large tower cases and you can put in a massive cooler in there. So when you look up a heat sink to match with your processor, Find one that matches or exceeds the TDP that you need to get rid of and know that if you're going to do any kind of overclocking, which is making the processor go faster and use more power, it's going to dissipate more heat and you need to adjust accordingly for that. You don't want to be limited by your cooler, you want to be limited just by the quality of your chip. All right, a common misconception is that when your processor overheats, it will no longer be usable or when your processor overheats, your computer will instantly shut off and yell at you and report you to Microsoft. Or just bad things will happen. Well, not really. We don't see a lot of that these days because there's thermal protection and monitoring built right onto the CPU package. And this thermal monitor monitoring will kick in automatically if your processor exceeds possibly 98 degrees Celsius. At that point, it will slow stuff down. If it's unable to cool itself off, perhaps it will trip off at 101 degrees Celsius. But usually the cooldown mechanism works. Now the only time you would ever run into a problem with that is if you took off the heatsink while it, you're using your computer. Not smart. And it could also happen if the heatsink is not installed properly. Always, always double check your work. But I do want it, you guys to know that there is built-in protection and even if your laptop does sound really hot, it's not gonna, you know, it's not gonna overheat. It's, it may slow itself down, but it's not gonna overheat. So there are some edge cases I wanna go over. First off is the AMD Epic 7742 processor. This is a 64 core monster, and currently kind of one of the best of the best. This processor uses 225 watts by default. Now this can be changed with some overclocking and whatnot, but 225 watts right out of the box. That is huge. That's, you know, if you had four of those, you would have a, a, a good old space heater, and you probably would with an assembled system, given all the other components that would be running. Another specific edge case I'd like to go over is the Apple A13 Bionic chip. This is the chip that runs the iPhone 11 Pro. This chip uses a total of six watts. That's all and sometimes even less when it's in sleep or just not being used. Six watts, in the palm of your hands, crazy. And the last use case is actually my laptop. I'm a big fan of this guy. I bought him for 300 bucks last year 
and the processor is a Ryzen 3 3200U and it uses a total of 15 watts. Even while it's doing all the stuff it's doing right now, recording, or recording the microphone, um, it's playing some HD video in the background, and 15 watts. And that has a GPU on there as well, and just the entire package for all that it does, 15 watts. Wow, how far we've come. <laughs> so, in this video we talked about TDP, how much heat your processor produces from the package. I would ask that you guys find out what chip you're using, be it a iPhone 11 or your laptop or your desktop. Find out what that chip is and how much heat it's producing. And then also from there, if you can, figure out how it gets rid of that heat. Is it a stock cooler? Is it a cooler with heat pipes? Is it water cooling? Is it just a passive heat sink, like in the case of the iPhone? As always, thanks for watching, thanks for joining, and I hope I've taught you something in this video. Peace.